everyone, and welcome once again to the Vast and Ominous Comic Book Vault. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. It's time once again for new acquisitions. Hi, Dan. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fantastic. Dan, uh, we got lots of great stuff this week. Uh, really interesting things. Uh, uh, first issue of X-Files came out this week. I've been really looking forward to this. And uh, Age of Ultron ended this week. Um, and so we're going to have... Lots of stuff to talk about with that book. Um, I want to say, as always, thanks very much to Elite Comics for all their support of the show, for helping us out. And let's, uh, I, out here in Overland Park, and let's go ahead and jump right into it, uh, shall we, Dan? Let's begin with Age of Ultron, book 10. So, uh, you get to the end of this, and I gotta tell you, man, I felt, first of all, I really enjoyed this, but I felt like the same, I felt the same way I did at the end of Fear Itself. Yeah. Uh, the end of Fear Itself was just a bunch of advertisements for more for new ongoings or miniseries. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt like this was. Uh, I felt like, I mean, it's not necessarily bad that the story defied my expectations, but I was just expecting a little bit more considering that Bendis had had this in the works for like five years and this was supposed to be the big epic grand finale to his Avengers run and it ends up just being like the Avengers using cheat codes. To beat Ultron. In a fight. <laughs> I thought it was a little more involved than that. I mean, like, like the cheat. Okay, there were cheat codes, but the cheat codes were there because they had tampered with time and they had put them there from you know the 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 in, the inception of Ultron. And so, like, they, like I'm just saying that the events that led to that were included in the book and they were necessary. That's all I'm saying. They were to, to this story, I suppose, but, like, I don't know, I, I felt like Wolverine was the only character that really had anything to do at the end of the day, and he's yeah. left in a position where there's interesting things that they could do with him moving forward, where he uh, is all kind of happy with, every, with how everything worked out, but he knows that, oh, I probably shouldn't do that mess with time again but look everything ended up working out in the end and he doesn't know how much he's actually affected the multiverse that's true um so there's interesting things to take the character but i feel like as a story as a miniseries this didn't really do anything with any of the characters it's very plot driven um he set up a lot of threads at the beginning like that black Widow and moon knight thing where did that go that went nowhere yep. all the nick fury like little photos in the room like i felt like there was a lot of setup and no payoff for things in, in in this book at the end of the day and um the last half of it is just uh advertisements for new things which i'm excited for but uh i just don't think it's necessarily a great story yeah it's it's not a great story i i will say i enjoyed it uh i enjoyed the last several several issues including this one more than i did the first three or four only because um, I wasn't invested in a lot of the character stuff that I think you were invested in, and I was waiting for it to go someplace. And I wasn't convinced that it was going to go anywhere, and then I turned out to kind of be right. Um, but I'm just saying that, like, the plot stuff that's here, it being a really plot-driven book, I was able to enjoy it on the level of, of, you know, big, crazy time travel romp. And, of course, we do that kind of thing in comics all the time, so this is nothing special. But I got used to the idea that this was maybe nothing special. Having said that, um, it does deal at the end, and I don't feel I'm, like I'm giving too much away when I say this, it does deal at the end with the idea of maybe we've tampered with time one too many times, and I like that a lot. Um, I think it's time to go there, uh, and I think it's cool that they're, I think it's kind of fun that they're going there. Uh, it's a little flashpoint, but I, but, I, but I like that they're going there. I also really like that they're um, for further explaining how all the multiversal hijinks that are uh, happening in a, pretty much all of the Avengers books, how that uh, was all sort of caused. And um, it'll be interesting, especially in Uncanny Avengers, to see how Wolverine deals with all of that stuff. Um, because that's where a lot of stuff with Apocalypse and Kang and multiverses is happening there, and in Hickman's book, all that stuff's happening, and it's all supposed to culminate in the Infinity thing. So I completely agree with you. To, to see that stuff play out. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, th th this is not real cohesive as a story, as you said. Um, and, of course, Dan and I are both big character guys. So, yes, of course, this is disappointing. Mm -hmm. But um, Marvel still really has their head on straight as far as organization goes between their books. Oh, yeah, definitely. And this is a huge culmination of that. Uh, that's been fun on more of a micro level. This is a macrochasm of that. This is, we've got 
about all these books that have been dealing with because because how often you know you go back to Venice's Avengers right and you've got I know I've mentioned this a couple times you go back to Venice's Avengers and you've got that that um that big story of like like you know the whole reality is uh, is unhinging but then in, in none of the other books at Marvel at that time did anybody else seem to be noticing and here there's a lot of that stuff going on in different books right now of reality seems to be unhinging and it finally we're organizing it in such a way where it's all related that's if in, in the universe um i'm really excited to see that i think that is really cool it, it's just that i didn't expect this to be a universe changing event in the way that avx was and i didn't expect the AVS, avx to change the universe as much as it did so after they pulled off an event in um, such great fashion, in my opinion. I thought AVX was great. And then we come to Age of Ultron, Bendis is in this alternate universe. I feel like, okay, he's doing an event book that doesn't necessarily have to change everything. He's in an alternate universe. He's contained. He's going to be able to tell his own story. And this was not a universe-changing event. It wasn't its own story. It was just kind of like a bridge, a stepping stone between what AVX and Infinity um, that is which... that is fair yeah I mean I because I feel like a lot of the things that they that they're advertising at the end of this they set up one of which we definitely should talk about um, are things that you didn't need this book to do right I feel like if you skip this book you can all you need to know is that uh, Wolverine made the universes collide and that's all you need to know <laughs> <laughs> do you also find narratively? Do you also find it kind of jarring that um, that this whole thing by the end ends up being very much Hank Pym's story, and he's not even there through half of it? Well, it's the same thing with Ultron too. Like he's the villain in this, and he doesn't show up very much either. It's sort of strange. That wasn't a problem for me even the last issue, but then this issue where he almost comes full 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 center and seems like the closest thing we have to a protagonist next to Wolverine. I started getting more on your bandwagon from last time, where I was taking up for it, and then here I was like, yeah, I think Dan's right. I think it's too much about Hank Pym by the end. Um, I'll be looking forward to see if they can remedy that at all with the Mark Wade uh, epilogue issue focusing on Hank Pym. Um, if anyone can sell me on a concept uh, in a single issue, I'm betting it'll be Mark Wade. So hopefully he can do something with that. But as of right now, uh, yeah, I agree with you. So if you've been uh, if you've been paying attention to comic news, I'm not going to be uh, spoiling too much when I say this. But if you don't want to know what's on the final final pages of this, uh, skip to the next timestamp. Um, so Angela shows up at the end of this. Angela from Spawn, and I, I one thing I'm I'm wondering about Dan. Of course, we knew this was going to happen uh, since since the. We, we first found out that she was being added to the Marvel Universe, and that, right. that, Ga that Gaiman won that whole court case with McFarlane. And um, one, one thing I'm wondering is, um, they waited a while, I think, to announce that, but, like, was that in the works when they started writing Age of Ultron, or did they it force could that have been. in there? Bendis had this in the works, like, a couple years ago, so I wouldn't be surprised if his plans were drastically changed to tie into Marvel now and this new Angela thing by the end. Um, I loved her introduction, though. I thought it was really neat. Uh, yeah. And part of it is just because it's a great two-page spread. Her, her redesign is fantastic, mostly because it's not much of a redesign. Um, I love that the ribbons are still huge and taken up like the front of the thing, and she looks like a, she still looks like a Spawn character. And... <laughs> I am. This might just be my personal interpretation. I think she's still a Spawn character, Dan. I don't think. think so? Yeah, I don't think. Uh, and, I, and I think that they're going to do this, of course, without without having to ever mention Spawn or exactly where she comes from. Um, th this is a universe shattering event. And mm -hmm. what I think happened was I think this 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 event ripped her from Image. That's what I think they're they're doing with it because at the end of this she says she wants she wants revenge she wants retribution on whoever has brought her here, and uh, and uh, you know she says uh, I am an angel from the heavens and I will not be disrespected whoever brought me here against my will um, I'm I'm coming to end you that's what she says that's and cool. um, I read that and I might be wrong but I read that as oh okay so in the Marvel universe we've got all of these different like like uh, pantheons and things but we won't even have to deal with the Judeo-Christian stuff necessarily because she comes from a different universe where that stuff is all what the big god things are, man. 
Yeah, you're right. I wasn't even thinking about that. That's a very smart way to go about it if if that's the direction that they're going. And from what you said, every sign sort of points there. So Yeah. Um, I mean I might be re happy. I might be reading too much into it, but I really think she's the same character. I think this is the Angela we always knew and they've just ripped her from, from, from Spawn and put her in Marvel. Yeah, and one of the funny things I, I just wanted to mention, I thought it was a little bit amusing. Uh, I saw an interview with Casada on one of those Marvel AR things they post on YouTube, where they have like little short clips. And he was talking about the design process for Angela and her costume and her redesign. And he was saying that um, he wanted to go so for something that uh, captured the iconography of the character, but he didn't necessarily have a you know uniform design to go with because he said in Mc in the image universe in McFarlane's book people would draw her different from issue to issue and sometimes even panel to panel it was really inconsistent <laughs> I thought that was really funny <laughs> the only things that really matter are that she's kind of got the headpiece that she's got yeah. the staff and that she's got ribbons I mean like that's really all, all you got and that she's got the the black things around her eyes you know you got to have that um, right, yeah, and but, all uh, of that was there, so I thought she looked great. She and looks like An <laughs> Angela to me. Um, yeah, I was excited about it. Yeah, and I, I was excited to see Quesada doing interiors again, because as much as I don't like some of some of the editorial decisions he's made, um, he's, he's a great artist, and uh, I, I love his artwork. Yeah, I uh, thought I he did a thing. wonderful job, and I also th thought that it was consistent with the rest of the art in the book. Yeah, it, it, surprisingly so, too, um, because you had people like Brian Hitch, Quesada, and... Um, I think Peterson too, some the, the guy that had been taken over after Hitch, and they they don't really match up style wise, but somehow they made it look pretty pretty well. Uh, pretty good. There's you another know? there's another giant. Well, well, there's one huge two page spread where they show a bunch of different universes, uh, mm -hmm. and some of that I don't want to I don't want to give too much of it away, but there's one thing I wanted to mention, and that is uh, we we do see Spider Man 2099 there. Yes, we do. And I wonder if they won't do something with that. I kind of hope they do. Well, Dan Slott already said that he's showing up in Superior, which I'm oh, not going to read. So wow. I'm, okay. Well, I might. I don't know. I don't want to read. I don't want to read that book right now because I don't really want to support that book. I'm not. I'm not loving that. But I might read that issue just to see what what he looks. Just see what he looks like. Because if they gave Peter David a, a, another twenty ninety nine ongoing, I'd be over the moon. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, oh, well, anyway, I'm sorry. Was there anything else you wanted to mention? We need to move on. Um, um, I, yeah, there were some other cool revelations, but um, as per Polybag, which I saved because I'm lame, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything. So, uh, yeah, let's move on. I'm sorry, did you think I gave too much away? No, no, I just didn't want to talk... The Angela thing people already knew about. I just didn't want to talk about the thing we had talked about. Oh, a little bit. yes. We'll talk. You know what? We'll talk about that when it plays in. Um, and yeah. there's going to be a book about that, so we'll we'll get to talk about that. Yeah. yeah so exactly. no problem. Okay. Well, uh, let's go ahead and move on, shall we? Uh, and and we'll uh, we'll start going a little bit faster now. I wanted to give that a few minutes because um, there was a lot to talk about there. Let's let's move Perfect. on. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, also reiterate, yay, Angela. Um, and I can't wait for issue five of Guardians <laughs> of the Galaxy. Uh, <laughs> Let's move on to Ultimate Comics All New Spider Man number twenty four. Uh, the uh, birth of um, Ultimate Cloak and Dagger. Uh, we got to see Cloak and Dagger at the end of, of uh, issue twenty three, and um, I was like, "Well, I don't know Ultimate that well. Have they ever been in, in here before?" And apparently, they did not. And this is, yes, and this gives us their their new origin uh, in 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 this universe. What did you think, Dan? I was I kind of enjoyed this. I thought. The characters, um, the little time that we get to spend with them, because Bendis is such a master of dialogue. I mean, he has these these people talking back and forth for like one issue. We see these these sort of stereotypical when you think about it, teenage scenes like them two going to prom together and things like that. And but but it's not done in a corny way. They have this. Um, they you can see the chemistry between them, and it's not like this really corny romantic thing going on where they like, you know, it's love at first sight, and they kiss after prom, and that sort of thing. Um, it, it's a really genuine um, and honest relationship, and I, I really like the exchanges between them, uh, and you really buy that they're, they, why they would work as a team in that way. I found uh, it charming. And was yeah, surprised, and so was surprised that I did. I, I, I caught myself smiling at a prom scene, and I was like, wow, that's impressive. Well done, Bendis. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I did think it was a little strange that we derailed the Miles story to tell Cloak and Dagger's origin, but maybe it'll play uh, more important into the ongoing narrative in the future. Um, but I didn't mind having that uh, 
short uh, discourse, especially since Miles is just sort of at, at this stage now where he's being not proactive and doesn't want to be Spider-Man, so it's nice to not have to concentrate that on, on that for an issue, I suppose. I was worried issue. he was going to be put too much in the background because of their, their origin, and, uh, and, and like, like you, I was like, this is a little bit of a strange place to do this. Then again, if you'd done it like as its own mini or something, probably 500 people would have bought it, you know? So I mean, <laughs> like, I, so I, 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 I kind of I get, I kinda get that it had to go somewhere, and that Cloak and & Dagger, and it's also fair because Cloak and Dagger are often Spider-Man characters, so yes, I was yeah. more they okay with that. And I mean, like you know, Dan and I have reviewed Maximum Carnage together. I was sort of excited to see Cloak and Dagger uh, uh, just in yeah. this. Um, and like I said, I like I like this version too. I like how much of a couple they are. But what I was going to say is, um, yeah, he gets derailed a little bit for them, but then he also has 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 one really dramatic moment with with Gwen Stacy. So it's still his yeah. book. He still he still gets huge things to do. It's still very much about um, you know uh, people trying to get him to put the costume back on when he doesn't want to. Isn't it really interesting, by the way, to go? back and compare this to where he was at the beginning of his of, of, of his early Spider-Man days, um, where you know the first yeah. the first several issues, um, it's it's uh, people some of the same people that are now trying to get him back in costume, telling him uh, that that uh, what he's doing is sacrilege, that he shouldn't be uh, that, that, he, that he that he shouldn't be uh, putting on Peter Parker's costume or or, or be, being Spider-Man, and that um, and, and also that uh, he can't he can't handle it, he's not mature enough, he's he's not he he, he doesn't mm -hmm. have enough background, all of that, and. And now some of those same people are trying to get him back in the suit. Um, I love that. That's cool. Yeah, I love that um, this time jump, I think, has done a lot for reinvigorating this book and in my interest in it as yep. an ongoing month-to-month -month reading experience. Yeah, me because too. Because the status quo changed so drastically, I'm sort of, I'm liking um, exploring Miles at this age now um, because he's able to interact with women in romantic ways like we'd seen in the last issue and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying this and um Dan, your instincts for Spider Man are uncanny, may I just say? Uh because yeah. two issues before they did all this, but well, before we knew that he was gonna do the, 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 the time jump, you said, uh, I really need a new status quo for this. You said you said you said I, I need Miles Morales to have his own Spider Man status quo where where he's dating and stuff. And I was the naysayer that said, Hey he's thirteen, they're not gonna give him somebody to date, you know. And um <laughs> then then like two issues later we we we, we jump ahead, we've got Miles Morales' real status quo, and um, I'm my my interest in this is completely renewed again. All of a sudden, so yeah, your 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 instincts are uncanny. Oh well, thanks. Uh, that just reminded me too. One of the other things I really enjoyed about this is that we're finally getting traditional Jameson Spider-Man status quo, and it's a really legitimate motivation because of Jameson's connection to Peter Parker and how much he. Um, ended up appreciating him uh, at the end of uh, the death of Spider-Man uh, thing. Now, it, it's logical that he would hate this guy, the new guy, with such a passion. Yeah. And I like that they showed the... We don't see Jameson yet, um, but I like that we sh showed the new, the headline from the Daily Bugle, and it was like, you know, Spider-Man is a menace and all that sort of thing. It's cool stuff. Yeah, and um, that was also, I thought, just kind of narratively a, a neat way to, um, to uh, introduce... Their uh, cloak and daggers backstory, and that they and, and that uh, you know they they were in a coma or whatever, and um, I don't know uh, uh, the the way the way they get their powers, I think, is really kind of interesting, and you know the gaggle of mad scientists that get together and they kind of create them, and um, that they're they're delving into the whole black the whole dark matter thing with dagger or with cloak. Um, I don't yeah, know. and I thought it was, was so good. cool that that um, society of mad scientists is all supervillains before they become supervillains. Which was really interesting, like um, Mr. Sinister, the leader, uh, Aram Zola, um, who else was there? Oh, oh I, the female. I, I didn't get. There? I didn't get that Sinister was there. I didn't. Ca I didn't catch on. Yeah, to that. that was the thing in Essex. Okay, I didn't catch on to that. I should have. Now that you say that name, I'm like, oh yeah, of course that is Sinister. But yeah, I didn't catch on to it. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I thought all that stuff was cool. It'd be interesting to see if they play any role in this because Sinister in this book would be awesome. Let's move on uh, to this is this is really good. Let's move on. Uncanny Avengers number nine. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, I love that Remender is making an Avengers book about interpersonal relationships, and um, be, because like Bendis' Avengers stuff, it it concentrated on that, but I feel like he forgot to put action and adventure in the book. And that's what you want from the Avengers. X-Men, I think, is suiting his sensibilities a little bit more because he's just 
having conversations with, with people. And that's the way Claremont did it. Remender's rem remembering <laughs> that well done. To, to do an Avengers book, you need to have a big action adventure, over the top, big Kirby sci fi thing going on at the same time as all of that stuff. And he's balancing that really well. And I, that's what makes this feel like such a classic Avengers book to me. I really love that about it. Um, there is this uh, big, giant... By the way, Wonder Man is growing more and more on me. Um, I yeah. just wanted to tack that on real quick. I, I, right in the middle of this, a, a great deal of this issue is this, um, is this huge uh, debate, this huge, like, like, philosophical debate about the thing, uh, uh, um, uh, what's, what's his name? Um, Summers, um... Alex, Summers. Alex, thank you. Uh, the thing, the thing, uh, the thing Alex Summers said uh, a couple issues ago uh, that I totally agreed with him, and I like Alex Summers more now because he, he, he and I have the same sensibilities. Um, <laughs> where, where, uh, where he said, I don't, I don't mind saying this is my mutant politics uh, that uh, that that, um, that mutants are uh, really not a separate species and that they are just humans with superpowers, and um, and that uh, you, you know we we can all be people and we don't have to look at ourselves as separate groups. And um, mm -hmm. there's this huge debate about that. And uh, it goes really, really deep into all of that, and it could have been more heavy-handed than it was. Um, I was surprised that I was that I was so riveted by just seeing characters for five pages, kind of you know, have this debate. And um, and uh, we've still, I mean, I do feel like there's a little bit of talking in circles with with uh, with. Let me just say with with, with Rogue and and, and uh, Scarlet Witch, because I feel like the argument that they have, they've kind of had before. Um, some yeah, of it, it's just sort of playing through the same beats every time they speak now. Yeah, I think so. But the rest of it, and some of what they say is really is really good and really well articulated. Uh, but the rest of that scene, I thought was really cool. And it was also kind of fun because it was in, in the danger room. So while they're talking, you've just got like 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 Venom and uh, Doctor Octopus and uh, Green Goblin like. Yeah, that was very cool. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, one of the things that I really liked about this too was that. Um, like we had been talking about before, um, saying that Wolverine was just sort of there in this book since the first couple of issues, we actually are getting that personal connection with Wolverine coming in and making him um, a viable part of this cast again. Because he had been fall he had fallen by the wayside a little bit um, for the, fa the past like four issues or so, I think. And um, I'm glad that he's, you know, they're giving him something to do. And I love the parallel that Revenger's making with the Apocalypse Twins and... Um, Cyclops, because they're trying to make a mutant homeworld for the mutants, and Cyclops did the same thing with the island utopia, but just yeah. on the Earth. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that Alex Summers is the guy that's sort of trying to keep the team together. Um, he's I, his ideas are totally contrary to uh, the Apocalypse Twins, and um, they're going to win if Alex Summers' ideas don't win out. And those are also Cyclops' ideas. So it's almost like this is Alex Summers' book, which is a really interesting thing. And the Apocalypse Twins and in Kang's, like, the plan has has been all along, like, separate the mutants from the humans and then we can accomplish anything. Uh, yeah. The, the idea is this really... I mean, I feel like from their perspective, these really are the same people, and all we got to do is split them up, and then we can win, you know? And so um, it's almost it's almost as if they agree with Alex Summers, you know what I mean? And that's the reason they can yeah, win, because all they, all they have to do is, is, um, is uh, you know, create this animosity between these two groups and make them have to choose. I feel like the whole message of this book is we don't have to choose between sides in situations like this. I feel like we can, fight, as human beings, we can find common ground. And um, it's, a, it's a good message. It's a good uplifting message. But then the question is, will that actually win out at the end? Because right now, things are not looking quite that rosy, right? Um, and again, yeah. you know, that's been what they've been saying for the last several issues. Uh, uh, let's find a way to split them up. And then um, I feel like uh, with the, the giant uh, f uh, argument, I almost said fight, but it's not a fist fight. The big argument between uh, Wolverine and Captain America. Boy, they haven't been getting along since AVX, have they? Uh, Wol Wolver enduring AVX. Uh, Wol Wolverine, <laughs> yeah, he threw them out of a plane. They're not getting along. Um, Wol Wol Wolverine and, uh, and, and Captain America. Um, it's interesting to see that, Cap without giving too much away, that Captain America seems to be somewhat. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I can almost fault him for helping out the Apocalypse Twins' plans. Uh, yeah. If he's not careful, you know? Um, wow. I don't know. It's very involved. 
that's what I love about Remender's Captain America, not only in this book, but in uh, the solo book, too, is that he writes him uh, as a uplifting and hopeful um, figure to aspire to, but he's not a man without flaws, and I, I like that he realizes that about him. Uh, like, Captain America is, like, not a naive idealist, but he does have certain prejudi prejudices about things, just like any human being would. And um, I, I really like that Remenda realizes that, and Steve Rogers isn't perfect. I just wanted to mention in an amusing little detail before we move on. Uh, did, yeah, you, sure. did you catch that while Rogue and Scarlet Witch are arguing in... I laughed out loud. That, that while they're arguing about, about all this really heavy philosophy, and I'm supposed to be... And I am in involved, but I'm supposed to be really invested in what they're talking about. And then, in the background, you've got Wonder Man fighting this fake Venom. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this page where, like, 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 just behind this dialogue, you keep you keep seeing Wonder Man in these really epic poses, fighting holograms, and then you turn the page, and on one panel, uh, uh, Venom is like standing over him, and then on the next panel, he's got him in like a chokehold, like right behind them while they're talking, and it was just really funny to me. I found it interesting that Wonder Man didn't get involved verbally in that fight at all, and just fought the holograms, but said he was a passive, especially because he's a Pacifist. Yeah, I, I guess that's I, that must be how he uh, how he lets off steam or something. <laughs> That was really funny. Let's go ahead and move on, shall we, to IDW. Uh, this is our uh, our uh, dual IDW book this week, and uh, this is our last book together, then we'll go to solo stuff. Uh, this is uh, the, Ninja I, I always forget what to call this, the Ninja Turtles Micro Series Villains Series. Uh, there's four of these. This is the third one. This is the one for Old Hob. Once again, I have to give Dan credit. Uh, now, we, we've known, I think, for a while that Old Hob uh, actually did not die in that scene. I thought he, I thought, I thought he got killed. And I think, I think it's been revealed that he was alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, but... But, um, or maybe I just knew that because I knew this was coming. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, and uh, and Dan and I had this big debate when we were reviewing Ninja Turtles back then. We had this big stupid fanboy debate. Um, really, like 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 we, we should we should have been wearing pocket protectors because of the <laughs> because, because of this conversation we had. Where I was like, no, clearly he got he got killed, and he, because he was shot. And then Dan was like, I think he got shot in the shoulder. I don't think he's dead. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't die. Uh, so anyway, um, so a point. It's a more involved to Dan. explanation in this book. To be fair, though. No. no no, there is. But point to Dan. You called that they were going to keep him alive, and I, I guess that was part of that was uh, my in my personal interest encroaching in the book because I didn't care for Old Hob, so I sort of wanted him to die so they could get rid of him. Uh, yeah. This this though made me like him more. What do you think, Dan? I thought this was actually really pretty good. Um, I like you wasn't a huge fan of this character um, before. Uh, I do. I think he's okay. I, I thought he was just going to be the initial antagonist for the turtles like you know in the first story arc that he was going to go away yeah but um i liked that they paralleled the one another one of the uh aspects of who the turtles are in this character um like they've been doing with all the villains where here um we have the parallel that the turtles always because of what they are they're teenage mutants and turtles they'll be social outcasts in this world and the only reason they are who they are is because they have a family to back them up, and that, that nurture is what makes them who they are, good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Old Hob is a social outcast that just didn't have anybody, and that's why he turns out bad. And I like that parallel quite a bit. That's basically what the whole issue's about. And I really enjoy that he, that, uh, you know, we see why he's got such a chip on his shoulder. We see why he's so rough around the edges. Uh, I mean, like, he, he, he was an alley cat uh, that got thrown out by his by his, his human family that kept him as a house pet. And uh, so he was like this before he was mutated. I think it's kind of interesting, by the way, that uh, that, that in, this, in this version, uh, these characters um, it kind of have some of the personality that they had before they get mutated, and yeah, it's giving. It's kind of interesting. It's giving you the sense because because obviously you know um, um, uh, animals aren't as sophisticated as humans, but they have they have feelings and they do change. And um, you know if if you have a if you have a cat that was because uh, because I, I I I knew someone with a cat like this once where like uh, like it was cared for well for a while, but then like it, it got an owner that was really 
bad to it and bad things happen to it and so then like uh, like once once this lady I knew that got this cat had this cat it wouldn't go outside anymore like 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 oh, okay. yeah I mean like like you're just like people they have feelings and they can change yeah, you know yeah. and so uh, it's kind of neat that they that they keep some of that with them when they when they get mutated and they become personified and uh, yeah. so uh, what we have what we have here uh, is is a guy looking for a family and he never can find one he's in, like you said he's a, he's a social outcast uh, he's not just a mutate but he's he's ugly even for a mutate I mean he got his he got his eye gouged out and that's Splinter's fault so he automatically has a good reason to um, have to, to, to have like a, a personal vendetta against one of our characters um, so that that's that's working okay could have been silly uh, ends up not being that silly in this I'm surprised but he has this great line uh, where he um, where he's he's working for uh, Baxter Stockman Baxter Stockman takes him in and uh, and and uh, we get a little bit of flashbacks of things we've seen before with that and um, and uh, they start uh, experimenting on on him and he has this great line this is what really sold me on it uh, because old Hob is still at heart a house cat and it sounds yeah. stupid until you read the book I really liked it and he has this great line where he says um, I have been cared for and this is not what that feels like Yes, that was very. That encapsulated the whole the whole issue for me, and it made this it, it made the whole thing work. I was really impressed. I was really impressed too, um, and I actually kind of like this character now. I'm actually going to look forward to see what they do with him, and um, they do set it up a relationship between him and Slash in this too. Um, I like so that too. See where that goes. Yeah, uh, that that's really cool. And uh, the last the last uh, uh, book in this series, I'm assuming they're doing four, like they did with all the other micro series. Um, if they're only doing four, the last one is going to be Alapex, and uh, I will be really interested to see if they can make if they can do to, for Alapex what they did to Old Hob, uh, because yes. Alapex is also a really I mean she's she's kind of cool, but I don't know anything about her, so I, it's going to be interesting to see if they can make me um, if they can. You know, make my interest in her rise like they did with this guy. Yeah, and it's very cool that um, literally all of the villains are going to probably be fighting each other in this city fall thing. Um, and maybe they're setting up a big villain team up between Shredder and Krang and everybody to fight the Turtles because that would be really cool too. Yeah. Um, I'm just excited about everything IDW Turtles moving forward. It's such cool stuff. Uh, all three of these have been really good so far, and they're not all by exactly the same people. I think Burnham did the first two, but then this one is by a writer I don't know, uh, Jason Caramella. Are you familiar with his work? I'm not familiar with his work at all, but I really enjoyed this. Um, um, I wouldn't be uh, opposed to him getting uh, another micro series issue if, in the future. Or if he is, and I, I'm being, I'm ignorant because I don't know him, but if if he if he is like brand new or hasn't done much work, uh, he's he's worth uh, a second chance. He was quite, he did quite a good job with this. I agree. I uh, the art was pretty good too. I'm yeah. not familiar with the artist either. Yeah, and consistent with what was done with the other with the other two. Um, I was a little bit. Um, the only complaint I have about this at all, and it's not even much much of a complaint at all. Um, I just thought of this, Dan. Is um, the first two books there was somewhat of a narrative connection between them, and this one really had nothing to do with the other two. That's very true. Agreed. Not a big deal, but I did think it was. I, there it was, was the connection neat. to Baxter stopping in the past, but it wasn't like a present connection. That's. Yeah, that's true. Maybe that's how they were doing. They were trying to connect it, but we didn't get a present connection between the first two. So, right, exactly. Uh, Dan, let's move on to solo books, shall we? What do you have? What do you have for us, Dan? I have the coolest thing in the world. This is Indestructible <laughs> Hulk number nine by Mark Wade and Matteo Scalera, and this is a team up between the Incredible Hulk and Daredevil: The Man Without Fear. These are what? no, two of no, my... it's not. Is it really? Yes, look at the cover with Matt Murdock and Daredevil on his shoulders, like the Angel and the Devil by Paula Rivera. This cover is amazing. Uh, I wish and, I, I uh, wish I'd read that this week. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, all right, so Mark Wade does this really cool thing uh, where he makes the Hulk and Matt Murdock the coolest like buddy cop duo ever. Uh, where he he does he basically does what was done with Tony Stark and Bruce Banner in the Avengers movie and makes that relationship work with Hulk and Matt Murdock, and they're really compatible characters, and I never would have thought of it that way before. Um, these two guys are the darkest, most tortured souls in the Marvel Universe, and they both sort of have this bleak 
they had this bleak outlook on life before. It's no coincidence that they're both being written by Wade now, and they both have a more optimistic look on things. But um, it's it's this really interesting relationship where like Banner and um, Matt Murdock are both like want to accomplish the same thing, but Banner's the really nervous guy, and Matt Murdock's the confident and cocky one, so they play off of each other like Stark and Banner do in the Avengers movie. It's a really fun relationship to watch see play out, and he uses Daredevil's powers really interestingly in relation to the Hulk, where um, because Matt Murdock can hear heartbeats, he can sense when Bruce Banner's getting angry, so he can help gauge, you know, how uh, the Hulk is feeling and stuff like that, and that makes him able to communicate with the Hulk, because he says the Hulk doesn't communicate through words, he just reads feelings. And that's why the Hulk would always listen, supposedly in this book, why the Hulk would always listen to Betty Ross be, uh, when the Hulk was Banner, because the Hulk responds to the feelings of people that Banner trusts, and that's in his subconscious. And Matt Murdock, because uh, he's Banner's lawyer in this, he trusts him, he's paid to do that. And there's all this like parallels drawn between Matt Murdock um, being uh, keeping Banner's interests in minds on a personal level as like a uh, you know a friend and Shield keeping his interests in mind in the in the interests of like you know us as a country but like in a collectivist sense it's it's really interesting um, there's a lot of cool stuff done here and uh, I really really like this uh, this is kind of like Hulk team up book so far um, except except for the first arc but I don't really care because this is great stuff. Um, <laughs> Mark Wade is the man. Is Wade gonna? Well, it is kind of neat that he's not trying to do exactly the same thing with Hulk that he did with Daredevil, right? Where it's where where it doesn't have to be like some huge giant sprawling mystery for forty five issues or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's just sort of like fun little uh, adventures, short arcs in, in the life of the the Hulk. It, it's really cool stuff. Is that is that just a one shot, or is he doing more with Daredevil in that? This is a three part arc. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, yes, very yes. cool. I'm really, really excited. Uh, well, I'm going to go on to a book that I was really, really stoked for, Dan. Uh, this is X-Files Season 10, number one. Uh, uh, this season thing is a big trend right now with comics uh, going after... I've noticed that, yeah. Uh, uh, ...ended or canceled TV shows. And I think it's interesting that uh, th this whole trend began with Buffy. I'm not sure if it was anything else that ever called it itself something season whatever post. I really think Buffy was the first thing that did it. Yeah, I can't think of anything before that, but then again, I, I wasn't really following. It, so. And uh, at the time, it was just kind of a novel idea. It was, it was, uh, you know, let's do, let's see what, what it would be like if the TV show kept going. And with that, it was kind of cool because uh, it was, it wasn't like, oh man, the show got canceled, so we've got to continue it in comic books. Um, uh, it was, well, this never would have happened, so it's almost more fun, right? Um, well, now they've done it with Smallville, which is the same sort of thing. Smallville was finished in ten years; it didn't get canceled. Um, you know, imagine if it was, well, we can't do an eleventh. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, uh, and then X Files had the same thing. You know, it was finished in nine, uh, and now now it's uh, X Files season ten. Um, Dan, uh, I wasn't blown away by this, but I liked it. Okay, I, I don't yeah. think it. I, I this is one of those things where I'm having a really difficult time forming an opinion based on just this issue. And you and I were discussing this a little bit before the show started, and I said that uh, it was a little bit like well, you, you you mentioned Ninja Turtles, and I had the same thing where like the like like yeah. we now think that this is one of the best things since sliced bread. Uh, but but after the first issue, uh, we were both like, well, it didn't get real far. I'm not real sure how to formulate a, an, an idea about it. Give me a couple more issues. Right. The craft was well done, but it wasn't like I was super invested in the world and the characters after that first I issue. I felt like I did later on. I felt there the way I felt here. Here, I feel like I just read the first ten to fifteen minutes of an X Files episode. Oh, and yeah. that's about how much I feel like I got in this first issue. That's not to say that there's not enough ground covered in, 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 an, in an issue. I'm not saying that the pacing is bad or anything. I'm just saying that, that I didn't get quite enough to really formulate a, an opinion about it. I, I'm recommending yeah, this book. Right. Um, I, 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 I enjoyed what I read, but um, I'm going to definitely buy the next couple issues, see where it goes. Um, basically, uh, we were leaving uh, Mulder and Scully off, kind of where they were at the end of Season 9, and here uh, they're, they're, uh, they're using... Um, they're they're using other names. Uh, they're, 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 now I haven't seen the last episode of X Files since it aired, so that was a really 
long time ago. And uh, I'm actually in the middle of watching X-Files right now, but I'm in the middle of season seven. I haven't quite gotten to the end yet. So I forget exactly where we're at at the end of that show. Um, so I probably would have appreciated this more had I watched the, the, the finale again. And I, Anyway, I'll catch up, and then I'll probably like this more, is my guess. Uh, but, 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 but basically, um, here, they are... I, I want to say they're pretending to be a married couple. They're using the same last name and they're living together. I don't think Mulder and Scully are actually married. And in the uh, in the X-Files movie that came out a couple years ago, they weren't married. Um, oh. And they weren't even living together anymore and they were calling themselves Mulder and Scully again. So um, so I, something had to have happened between this and that. And um, anyway, so... That's that, but that's where we're at. And uh, someone has though has figured out uh, they're they're so they're they're not they're not working for the FBI anymore. Somebody is trying to uh, get n uh, not just the X Files, but people who have. Uh, worked with the X Files before, and the X Files, of course, uh, nobody's working on them right now, and they've and, and and they've been and they've been closed, and so this is one of those stories where they're eventually probably going to get opened up again because someone goes after them and tries to open it again. And um, there's these really creepy um, uh, hooded guys that go after Dana Scully and um, also uh, go after uh, uh, Director Skinner. And um, there's this really creepy scene because it's X Files, so you need some total creepy, right? Uh, where where uh, where where Skinner gets gets uh, gets attacked by them, and uh, he he's he he all he he maybe gets killed, maybe not. Uh, I'll let you read it for yourself. But uh, anyway, I really don't want to give anything away. It's X Files, you know. Um, but uh, there's interesting, and then there's interesting character stuff like uh, Mulder is writing his memoirs and uh, yeah. and and, uh, and and stuff like that. Um, the only complaint I really have about this is um, I feel like Mulder is written maybe a little too jokey. Um, like he's always he, he's always got that really dry sense of humor where especially by the end of the show uh, where he started to come out of his shell a little bit and and, um, and by the middle to the end of X Files um, he was he was cracking jokes a lot more often than he used to but still in that really dry witted no nonsense pretending like he doesn't have a personality kind of way which is always why it was so funny uh, here I think they kind of play that on a little bit thick but he says some things that are very funny um, and I like that Chris Carter was actually involved with plotting this I don't know to what degree, but it's very much like the same thing we've got with Ninja Turtles, um, where you know you've got you've you've got a creator that's actually working on the book. So um, so so I'm, I'm so I'm glad they got Chris Carter working on this. Um, makes sense. I don't think he's doing much of anything else right now. Um, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, and uh, the art uh, was a little too minimalistic for my taste, a little too sketchy, but it's fitting the material quite well. So um, anyway, uh, yeah. So I'll talk more about this when I form more of an opinion about it. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, the next book that I have is Star Wars, Darth Vader and the Ninth Assassin. And, you know, as you can see on the cover, Vader will have vengeance. Well, apparently not in this way, because the scene never happens in the issue. Is Greedo um, at least in it? No. Oh, oh. Like, nobody's ever even in a cantina in the issue. <laughs> uh, but anyway, all right. uh, this issue is essentially the car ride to a planet, getting to the planet, and then, uh... Another cliffhanger that is going to make you wait till the next issue. So basically, Darth Vader's on a spaceship with some Imperial guards after the Emperor almost got assassinated. And they're like, I don't know what's going on. And Vader jumps out of the ship to like investigate the wreckage of the Star Destroyer that had been blown in half. And he does a lot of like crazy Darth Vader lightsaber force stuff. And you're like, oh, look how cool Darth Vader is. And then he goes into this temple where supposedly the cult that was from last issue that had blown up the, the Star Destroyer, uh, like they have some sort of temple there, and Vader goes in, and it says something about him fulfilling another prophecy. Um, so I guess Vader is going to fulfill two prophecies, and <laughs> all this whole time, there is this assa the assassin that was introduced, I think, in the first issue. They look real different than they did in the first issue, from what I remember. Um, but the assassin is there, and Darth Vader goes into this really mysterious temple um, that, like, has a bunch of, like, crazy cultists in it, and the assassin just assumes that Vader will get out of it. He's like, I'll kill you when you get out. Go have your adventure, Darth Vader. So, uh, you know, hopefully he's just banking on the fact that Vader's going to get out of there alive, which I guess after witnessing all of that stuff that he did, that's a fair assessment. But, uh, I don't know, this is just kind of really plot-driven stuff, and, like, the only real character stuff you get for anybody is, like, um, Vader doing really cool things that make him look really, um, 
I'm trying to think of the word without using the cuss word. <laughs> 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 but you know, but you know what I mean. Uh, that's really all the, the the point of this is, which I didn't really need this comic to tell me that. But anyway, uh, this this was okay. Uh, the the there's some really cool imagery stuff done with the art, the lightsaber that I've never really seen Vader do before. But other than that, I can't really recommend this. Also, oh, it's, it's still a good it's still a good poster book though, right? Yeah, I mean, I'll show you some of the the cool Vader. He like spins his lightsaber like Thor in here and like throws it at somebody. He does. It's totally Thor. Like, look at this. Yeah, that's wow. He could fly if he wanted to. I know. That's preposterous. He could totally take his lightsaber and be like, and then yeah, to to me, my lightsaber. Wow. Right, exactly. But why couldn't we have had that scene in? Why couldn't we have had that Avenger scene in a Star Wars movie where like where like his lightsaber is across the ship and then he's like doing this forever and then it flies through all the decks and then he finally catches it. It can happen, J.J. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask you the obvious question? Sure. Why are you still reading that? Uh, I'm a completist. Oh. Okay. And. If I buy the first two issues of a mini, I don't want to, like, have a thing in my collection that's like, oh, you only have the first two issues of it if I ever want to go back and read it again. But, <laughs> but you're um, not going to go back and read that again. I don't know. I've, tr I've given all of the Darth Vader uh, minis from Dark Horse a shot because they've been pretty good. Oh, and, no, no, uh, fair enough, fair enough. I figured I'd give this one the benefit of the doubt because the, the last one was really good. Um, and the, the issue before this was decent, so I don't know. I'm three issues in now. Might as well go all in. Oh yeah, no. Um, you're you're at the point of no return. I think. Uh, ne uh the next thing I've got is Supergirl number twenty one. Uh, be beware the Girl of Steel, Dan. Um, gee, I wonder if you wrote Girl of Steel on this book just because Man of Steel came out last week. Hmm. I write it on that book that was supposed to be called Man of Steel, but they named oh. it Superman Unchained. Instead. Yeah. By the way, I would totally be okay with a Supergirl book called Supergirl: The Girl of Steel. Well. Actually, now that I'm saying it, it sounds like it would sound terrible. Um, well, whatever. Anyway, um, so I don't entirely understand what this cover's about, uh, because there's not really a great deal of wrath happening. Uh, in fact, kind of the opposite. Like, this, the, a lot of this issue is, is Supergirl soul-searching, and it's kind of about her figuring out how to not handle every situation with wrath. So, because that's been her whole thing in this series, is she solves problems by punching stuff, because she's got no... She, she, has, she, has, she has a bad temper, which is one of the things I kind of enjoy about it. She's really spunky, she's got a bad temper, and she's, um, and, and, and you know, she's really upset because her planet got blown up, and from her perspective, it was only a few months ago, and, you know, we still got that, all that going on, and, and so, um, you know, she's, she's on this planet she doesn't want to be on, and she just, you know, she doesn't have any patience, and she punches stuff. But then there's this great, um, there's this great panel in this where uh, she has, the, and then I'll backtrack and tell you what the actual issue's about. She, she has this, she has this great point in this where uh, she's, she's, uh, somebody, somebody attacks her, I won't give away exactly what the situation is. Somebody attacks her. Um, it's an alien on another planet, and um, and uh, she she uh, she tries to uh, talk this character down. This is the first time in 21 issues we've ever seen Supergirl really try to talk anybody down, uh, uh, re really. And she says, "I'm I'm trying this new thing. It's called not hitting things in the face." <laughs> Could awesome. we please just talk this out? And, uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty, oh, no, no this, yeah, here it is, here's the line, this is, all right, listen to me, I'm trying this new approach to problem solving called not punching things in the face. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed that. Anyway, uh, so, um, it, boy, I'm really liking this book again. Uh, a couple issues ago, I was kind of not sure about it with the whole Power Girl thing, I'm right back on board again with this. Um, I, one of the things I really like about this Supergirl is, or, or about uh, the, the uh, status quo of this Supergirl living on Earth, is that um, her best friend is Silver Banshee, which I just think is really kind of cool. Um, not that her best friend is actually Silver Banshee, it's that her best friend is a human who has Silver Banshee um, stuck in her subconscious, and there have been times where Silver Banshee has come back out, so like she's like a werewolf with Silver Banshee, and she's got this demon in her, and she even has this line uh, with Supergirl, where Supergirl is, I wish Spawn had a friend like this, because Supergirl is complaining... Spawn doesn't have friends. Supergirl is complaining about how much she hates living on Earth, and how Earth just keeps throwing her bad apples all the time, and now she's sick because of the kryptonite thing. And she, you know, she's still sick. She's still trying to cure herself from that kryptonite illness that she's had for three or four issues now. And after Hell on Earth, and then like. 
She's complaining that like the only boyfriend she's ever had turned out to be evil uh, because of hell and all of that. And um, Silver Man, she says that thing I always wish somebody would say to Spawn, which is which is uh, uh, basically cry me a river. Um, I think I think actually the the line she gives is vine me a vineyard, which I sort of sort of thought was or wine me a vineyard. And she says, awesome. yeah, and and she says and she says, look, we've all got demons. She says. I literally have a demon, you know, and I mean, like, this is Supergirl complaining to freaking Silver Banshee <laughs> uh, about about these about these, these problems. But uh, but anyway, so that was a really neat scene, and then Supergirl um, decides, well, I don't like living on Earth anymore. I'm gonna go see what else is out there uh, because I just like I'm throwing all these rotten apples. So she runs off to this other planet where there's this alien that um, that uh, might be able to uh, recreate Krypton from Supergirl's memories of Krypton, and that's kind of where we're left at the end. Um, this whole thing, uh, this whole book has. And this is somewhat of a slight against it. It's also sort of a quirky thing I'm enjoying. It's a little bit like Star Trek Voyager, where because the premise of the show is a, a, a starship stuck in another quadrant, every other episode sometimes it feels like is like uh, here's this thing that can get us home. Oh wait, no, it can't. And this 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 book is just like that. It's like it's like uh, here's here's a contrivedly yet another thing that maybe can bring Supergirl back to Krypton. Uh, and uh, it's it's kind of surprising that the first planet she comes upon, people know what Krypton is. Uh, but yeah. but uh, but anyway, um, by and large, I really really enjoyed this, and I'm kind of back on board with this series, and I think I'm gonna keep I, I keep I keep getting this sporadically, and I think I'm probably back on. Board with it. Um, I, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> I find it really funny that Supergirl now has an evil ex-boyfriend. <laughs> he, well, and, he, and he's Kryptonian. Um, but uh, I'm talking about like Scott Pilgrim, how he fights evil ex-boyfriends for that whole book. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, she kind of does. Um, except that uh, she won't have to deal with that probably because right now he's living in the past. So you know, um, <laughs> uh, because that way again, that was hell. You know, at the end of of, uh, of, of, um, of hell on earth, he gets he actually gets stuck in a vortex and goes back to Krypton in the past. So I, I don't think we'll see him for a while anyway. Uh, but anyway, go ahead, Dan. The last book I have on the agenda is New Avengers number seven. This is by Jonathan Hickman. And uh, we have Mike Diodato uh, doing the art duties instead of uh, Steve Epting. I think Epting's taking a little bit of a break, and Diodato was switching off art, art duties with him. And uh, this issue was absolutely fascinating. Um, Hickman's continuing to do this really interesting thing um, that I didn't really think I would be all that on board with. It's basically like taking these characters to the darkest place possible you can take them, but he's, he's justifying it. Um, I'm not one of those guys that like needs to see like the dark and, and grim deconstruction of superheroes all the time because I feel like it's been done well already in a lot of very well in a lot of places and that's what they've been trying to do since Frank Miller and Alan Moore wrote comics in everything uh, but this is really engaging um, we have multiple uh, plots going on through here um, but they're all really engaging um, the main one is this kind of cold war that's going on between Wakanda and Atlantis after AVX where Namor had destroyed the capital city of Wakanda and now they sort of hate each other and they're spying and there's all this animosity between them and um, Black Panther and Namor are sort of discussing the whole thing and because Black Panther is no longer the king of Wakanda uh, his uh, I think his sister uh, is the queen now um, he doesn't really have any say into how this war is going and they're sort of discussing how he would handle it as king, and Namor is saying maybe he doesn't have the backbone to rule because he's, he's too benevolent and he, he's naive and he doesn't see the world in the way that a king should, and it's this really interesting and engaging conversation about how benevolent a king should be and um, what he should do, what he should sacrifice uh, in the interest of his people, and I really liked that conversation. And then there's this really uh, interesting other conversation uh, we have between Reed Richards, Doctor Strange, and Doctor Doom in Latveria. And they're all, Victor had invited Reed and uh, Stephen over for dinner because uh, at the end of last issue uh, where we had that incursion and there was that invading army in Latveria, Doctor Doom had acquired a piece of technology from that world, the, the warriors had been invading them, and he's asking Reed about what's going on and, you know, he wants to basically know, like, why were you here? Why are these people invading my country? And, uh, Reed won't tell him, and 
Dr. Doom's like, look, uh, I'm trying to protect my people. I have the right to know if there's some sort of threat uh, going on, and the heroes won't reveal anything to him, and it makes Reed and Dr. Strange sort of look like the bad guys. Like, Dr. Doom's the truth seeker in this situation. He's the guy that wants to find out the real truth about what's going on in the world. That's really interesting. Uh, it almost looks makes Dr. Doom look like the good guy, which is a sort of interesting thing. Um, I don't know. I'm really enjoying how Hickman's uh, taking these characters and sort of turning... Um, everything they thought they knew on their head through these really dark situations. It's, it's really interesting stuff. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this. Oh, that sounds really good. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch up on that series really soon. You should. I think you would really enjoy it. Uh, the last thing I have is Batman and... Uh, what I like to call Batman ampersand, Dan. Uh, Batman and Batgirl, number 21. Um, so, uh, the last time I uh, reviewed this book, uh, I, I absolutely hated it. And uh, the only reason I decided to uh, try this again, um, I just I, I didn't have a whole bunch of books this week. I wanted to try something else. And um, this was uh, Batgirl, and I really liked Batgirl last week. So, um, I sort of wanted to... I guess I wanted to see if this was going to play into that at all, because I, I, I think I'm going to kind of hang on to that for a little while. Um... This is really bad, I, in my in my opinion. I, I really I really did not enjoy this at all. And uh, the, the, I, Peter Tomasi, um, his Batgirl's okay. I she's kind of. Uh, she's mostly just kind of complaining about all the same stuff she was last issue, or, or having having all the or last issue of a Batgirl, um, where she's so I mean these tie together in that they're both they're, they're they both have her dealing with thinking that she's killed um, uh, James Jr. But there's not any new ground covered here. Uh, there's this weird scene where she's sitting outside uh, uh, Commissioner Gordon's window while he's like. Uh, while he's like putting guns together or something, or like 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 where, 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 where he's like uh, uh, you know he's 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 doing he's doing that thing where you know you take your gun apart and you put it back together and um, oh, okay. while while he's sitting at his while he's sitting at his desk uh, doing that and smoking and contemplating life while pretending to shoot things. Um, uh, Bad Girl is sitting outside his, his window and um, she's kind of saying all these things that she wants to say about James Jr.'s uh, death. But she's saying it out loud and um, and at the end of it she's sort of like, you know, I'm glad we had this talk, Dad. And I'm pretty sure he's not, she's not actually saying it loud enough where he can hear her. It was just kind of a weird scene. I, I don't know. Like, like there's just a lot of awkward like that in this. Yeah, that's um, I guess it was just sort of like, well, I don't I, even know how to read that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure either. It's, I guess it's sort of like, like well, um, it's not enough to just play out this conversation in my head. I actually have to be right next to where he is and say it, even though I'm not going to say it actually right to him. Maybe, it's, maybe I'm not understanding something. I and and and, and again, Do you think the way like Peter Tomasi interprets those characters is just everyone in the Bat family is like insane. I don't know. I don't know. Batman trying to go to Frankenstein. Barbara Gordon's talking to herself. Yeah, the, the the thing is, I, I like That's funny. like I, I hate for my personal opinion of the last thing I read of Tomasi to encroach too much on this because I already opened this up, sort of thinking, oh well, that's right, right. the whole thing with Frankenstein. Yeah, I, I, I was know. just thinking, you know, oh, the whole thing with Frankenstein. Uh, we're still we're still there. Well, the thing is, this is still the same thing. I mean, like, the Frankenstein thing is even mentioned in this, and he's writing that same Batman. So, uh, every time Batman says something in this, it's not, it, it, it doesn't feel like Batman to me, and it's, it, and or at it's least not like... Batman that you like, or, and that's been in the other books. It's inconsistent. It doesn't feel like the way anybody has ever written Batman to me. I, I just, <laughs> like, 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 um... <laughs> He is well. No, it, it feels okay. If I have to say it, I will. It feels a little bit, I guess, like uh, like uh, Frank Miller's All Star Batman Robin version. I guess, if anything, I thought he was like that a little bit. Like in, uh, I don't know if you read War Games or War Drums or on that period. I heard Batman was kind of doing some crazy stuff, but I haven't read any of that stuff, so I wouldn't know. He's got this part where he's like, "Don't ever touch me, Bullock," and 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 stuff. But it's just, it's really weird the way, like, like it's just. Every Everything pisses him off, like everything. And so, so the thing is, he's still reeling about Damien's death, so he's letting it affect him too much. And the thing is, so, so yeah, okay. So he's going over the edge because of that. And I guess I'm supposed to be okay with that because it was his son and everything. But again, he's not acting like this in any other book. And all of the other books are having him also react to Damien's death. So it's not like they're ignoring Damien's death or like they're happening right. prior to that. It's not like this is gap filling, like between time 
this is the time morning and the books take place after. Those books dealt with it all in completely different ways, like you had said. It's, it's really strange. So this is just getting really ridiculous. Uh, the, uh, Tomasi in this book, his idea of good drama seems to be people shouting at each other constantly. And <laughs> you get to the end of this and there's this big showdown where uh, where we've got we've got Batman and, and, and Batgirl in the, ba in the Batcave because ba Batman has been ignoring her the whole issue. And the thing is, this is, tr this is why it, this frustrates me because these are all different interpretations of Batman, all taking place in the same universe, to the point where this is dealing directly with the end of uh, of Snyder's Joker arc, uh, where where uh, where he has you know death of the family, where where everybody disbands and, and kind of stops talking to Bruce Wayne. Well, that affects this, but the Bruce Wayne is not the same guy, so it's weird. Uh, so so um, he won't talk to Batgirl because she stopped wearing the, the the bat symbol. She took the bat symbol off her suit, and he won't even talk to her about it. And she has a reason for that, uh, 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 as given to us in the last issue of Batgirl, where she didn't even want to put the suit back on for a while because um, because because she feels like she doesn't deserve to wear it because she's blaming herself for the death of James Jr. Like I like I mentioned last week, and um, that's the reason she's not wearing the belt, the bat. She doesn't feel worthy of it, but she feels like she has to go out and fight crime because there's different things that she's, you know, respons that she feels yeah, responsible yeah. for for doing. And um, so Batman won't give her the time of day because she's not wearing the bat crest, and he's he's basically. Um, he's, it's just this really weird antisocial behavior. Batman's always antisocial, but this is over the top for Batman. The way he's the way he's reacting, and um, so like there's this thing with them in the Batcave, and uh, and like he just starts breaking things. Like like like, uh, like there's this part. Um, this is toward the end, so I, I maybe I'm giving too much away. So you know, skip ahead if you really care. But um, there, there, there's the basically um, she's worried about him, so she's taking video of him. She's sneaking where he is while he's trying to stop this uh, this hostage situation. She's taking video of him, and he, she shows him the video in order to uh, try to help him realize that he's going overboard in the way he's, he's, he's attacking criminals. And I feel like we've been here before. It's exactly the same thing like with, J with Jason Todd. And um, after Jason Todd, the, 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 this fear that Batman's going to go overboard. I just, it's, it's, you know, um, rehashed territory. And Batman just freaks out and goes, how dare you put me under surveillance? And he breaks half his computer screens. It's really over the top. Anyway, um, yeah, so yeah. I didn't care for this. Like just me. I don't like this version, and he's not consistent with yeah. the rest of them. That sounds the, exactly what I expected the Batman books to be for like a year after Damien died, and I was not really looking forward to that, so I don't really have any interest in checking that book out if that's going to be the premise moving forward. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, I mean, it's absurd. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, I, can, I cannot recommend this. This might be somebody's Batman. This might be Batman, like, you know, what some people really want. You know, you know the, the, uh, the uh, uh, hey, what would it be like if Batman went over the edge where, like, you know, he had it reeled in, um, but then he just, he just doesn't know how to... But I mean, he's passive aggressive, and I just like yeah. I don't like my Batman this passive aggressive. So whatever. Um, I I, di I didn't think it worked. Uh, Dan, let's go ahead and go on now to book of the week, shall we? What is your favorite book for the week? Oh, this is a tough decision. It it was either New Avengers or Indestructible Hulk, but um, I feel like last time Indestructible Hulk came out, I picked that. So <laughs> I'm gonna go with New Avengers because I liked it. I honestly did like it. it, it uh, just as well as Hulk for completely different reasons, as I had, you know, I talked about in the reviews. But um, this book is just c continuing to be one of the most engaging and thought-provoking uh, superhero comics I've read in a long time. And it's character-driven. It's not long-form Hickman, you know, a standard fare sort of confusing stuff until you read all of it sort of thing. And I really like that about it. It's really accessible. So. Highly recommend this series. It's it's great stuff. Before I tell you my pick of the week, I feel the need to remind everyone that pick of the week is entirely subjective, and that I am not choosing the thing that I thought was the most thought provoking or best character piece. <laughs> uh, I'm picking the book that made me uh, uh, smile really big a couple of times, and so this is bizarre, but I'm picking Age of Ultron book, book, book Dan. I really am. Uh, and Dan's like, why are you picking that book? Well, um, I can completely understand because. <laughs> Angel's a big deal for you. 
Yeah, and I and of course I knew she was going to be in this, but I, the way the way it was there was really exciting to me, and um, there were a couple other things that made me smile real big that I was really excited about. So I'm not sure if this is absolutely not the best book I read this week, but it was the one that got me giddy, and sometimes I feel the need to pick things based on that. Um, if I had to pick what I thought was the best, uh, uh, you know, you know, character character thing this week, uh, probably Ultimate Spider-Man. Uh, actually, yeah, would, would probably be the thing I the thing I would pick. Uh, but yeah, the one I the, the thing that I had the, the the most the most fun like 15, 20 minutes with was Age of Ultron this week. Well, everybody, thanks as always for watching uh, new acquisitions. And uh, if there's anything you'd ever like to send us uh, to review on the Comic Book Vault, you can always send that to our PO box. That's Geek Solution PO Box one four one eight three Lenexa Kansas six six two eight five. Dan, thanks for joining me as always. Thanks for having me, as always. I had a great time. I really appreciate it. We'll do it again for you next week. And if you're ever in the Kansas City area, uh, won't you check out my favorite comic book store in the area? It's Elite Comics in Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, they're helping us out with the show, and so I uh, want to mention them to you again. Uh, thanks very much, Elite. Sure appreciate your help. And uh, as always, I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Happy reading.